Thank you very much, Mirka, for this introduction, and uh, thank you to Hacking Habitat and Impact Festival for bringing me to Utrecht. Um, I should say at the outset that at most events where I speak, I am uh, introduced as an internet critic, and tonight's was not, and a skeptic, which is worse, and tonight's was not an exception, and I always try to challenge that view from the very outset because it, I think, shapes the rest of the perception. I don't think that in any meaningful way I am an internet skeptic if by the internet you mean a collection of technologies like sensors, uh, big data algorithms and so on. What I am critical of and what I am a skeptic of is the ability of uh, corporations, most of them American ones, to deliver on the promises that they make about these technologies that they come to own and run in accordance with their business models. So in no way would I like to send the message that all of those technologies are useless, pointless, or irrelevant. What I would like to emphasize, and that will be probably at the heart of my presentation tonight, is that the current way in which they're owned, run, and administered by a handful of giant American monopolies does not really reflect the interests of the public, and certainly so the public in Europe. So this is just a footnote to my uh, biography. Uh, now, to kick it off, what I was invited here, and you know, we had to uh, bring together the themes of these two festivals, uh, one of which is about how to beat bureaucracy, and the other one is about the future of the past. I immediately thought of the welfare state in Silicon Valley, in part because, in some sense, when you think about bureaucracy, probably the first thing that comes to mind is precisely the welfare state. And second, I think, more and more people are increasingly convinced that it's very hard to see what kind of future uh, the welfare state might have as it's either running out of money or it's being displaced by much leaner, faster, more effective, and of course digital alternatives, most of them provided by uh, Silicon Valley and other technology firms. Somehow, companies like Google can be disrupted if only we fund enough entrepreneurs working in a garage who you know, will be the European version to Steve Jobs and will come up with a better algorithm and then turn uh, sort of uh, their company into an Airbus to, going to Google's Boeing, right? I'm afraid this is not going to happen because again, we fundamentally misunderstand, misunderstand that this new welfare state that's being uh, built by Google, Facebook, and others is ultimately built on data. Right? This is what drives it. It is data, right? And it's data that allows them to offer all those services because they have found a way, and I'm not saying that this will last forever. Perhaps in a good world, the advertising markets will collapse overnight and there will be no value in this data. I mean, there's also a possibility and we can hope and pray in the sort of best Walter Benjaminian sense that perhaps uh, there will be this religious uh, experience happening. Short of that happening, Data remains the asset that makes those companies almost impossible to disrupt. And I actually think that if Google manages to penetrate many of those domains, and you know, I haven't even mentioned half of them, I mean, if you really pay close attention to Google, you'll see that they're building new laboratories and apps, like mushrooms they're growing inside the company. They're building a special lab for solving city problems. They're trying to uh, fight and solve aging, whatever that means. Uh, they're trying to build smart lenses to help people with diabetes. They're trying to enter quite a lot of areas that have nothing to do with search, but have quite a lot to do with data, right? And why is thinking about data so important these days? I would argue that ultimately, we should not even imagine that in five years' time, Google will still be a search company. I think this is a paradigm that's completely uh, outdated. We should start thinking of Google as a data company and perhaps as some kind of a welfare consultancy company. They will not be offering search in the traditional sense, and you already know it if you've been using any of their flagship products like Google Now. If you look at Google Now, Google Now is actually a product that is cannibalistic on Google's own core product, which is search. For those of you who don't know, uh, Google Now is a service that basically integrates 
not just every single Google service that you might be using, like Google Maps, Google Mail, YouTube, Google Scholar, and so forth, but also integrate some third-party services like Spotify, Airbnb, Uber, and others, which basically means that anything that happens in your life, your travel, your uh, you know, visits to museums, you're walking in the city, you're going to restaurants, everything is being analyzed in real time. All the email that comes to you that mentions a particular event, you, know, you might have a meeting at seven o'clock, that meeting will be automatically added to your calendar. All of that is a way to take hassle out of your day, everyday living, which also means that you want to take the hassle of search out of your everyday living which means that you will be conducting searches for people before they even want to search, right? And this is what Google means by autonomous search, which is basically trying to feed you and serve you enough data in real time, anticipating your needs based on your location, previous experiences, and so forth, right? Which to me means that all this talk about algorithms as a way to disrupt Google is misleading because clearly here the predictive power does not lie in the algorithm, it lies in the data that Google has accumulated and keeps on its servers. And there's also the data, by the way, about how many steps do you take this month as opposed to last month. I mean, it's one of the cards in Google Now, which if you enable certain settings in your phone, will pop up and tell you that, well, this month you have not been walking uh, enough. Right? which would probably be a card that your insurance company would like to see one day. Right? I mean, there is quite a lot of data that's of very sensitive and interesting nature that's being collected, and you can clearly see how one's tied to a very different service like insurance or like health will have a very different value from the kind of data that we are generating in our inboxes now when we think about advertising. But I'll just finish here, but I just also don't want to sound like a utopian here who thinks that the changing the data ownership regime will solve all of our problems. I mean, the problem, of course, is much deeper and has to do with the infrastructure that also generates that data. So we also have to think about many other layers. Who owns the sensors? Who owns the networks? Who owns the telecoms? All of those questions that have been taken off the table through uncritical embrace of privatization have to be brought back if we really hope to live in a world where Silicon Valley is not our sole provider of public welfare services. Unfortunately, we are nowhere close to doing that, but I'm afraid that without having this holistic vision for how we can reclaim some of that infrastructure back, we will end up with either Google or some smart app running our health, education, and transportation. Thank you very much. I would just like to highlight the fact that it's not just a matter of people being ethical or unethical in their choice of, in their choice of platforms. There are many services for which currently we would not find an alternative. There will not be an alternative for a service like Google Now. And it's not a matter of you having to internalize this logic and feel responsible for all of the choices that you are making. That would be kind of following the very same neoliberal logic. I mean, we have to be able to imagine that A, there are alternatives. B, we have to imagine that questions, some of the questions here will not be resolved by people choosing or not choosing to participate in a particular platform. Like the question of data ownership, here there is a legal framework that either is in place or is not in place. And then, you know, with the question of big data and democracies, I mean, look at the United States. I mean, I'm sorry, they are sitting on more data than any government in history, probably China. And I actually think Americans probably have the Chinese data, while the Chinese don't, despite all the rhetoric of cyber insecurity and cyber hacking. Right? And how are they using it? I mean, like, but you have to understand the model. If Google was not a monopoly, NSA would not have all this data. Google works for the NSA. They are the company that goes and systematically collects all the data like a vacuum cleaner from 25 different domains, puts it in one database, and then all they have to do when the NSA come in and take it. They don't have to take it from 25 sources. They don't have to take it from 25 companies. They can just take it from one. Right? And the question between surveillance, democracy, monopoly, finance, this is not, you know, rocket science. You can figure it all out. And I'm afraid the situation here is not as rosy. Sorry, we keep talking about consumers' rights and all those fancy things, but, like, where is it? Okay. There are more questions over there. Please.